Hey everybody and welcome to Estuary. So we are continuing on with our ecosystems and we have just finished the intertidal zone and now we're actually starting to go a little bit farther out. We're going to be getting into estuaries. Now estuaries is kind of an intertidal zone because there are some tidal fluctuations there but it's not really the same as like a rocky intertidal or a sandy intertidal zone because it is very very specific. An estuary and the definition of an estuary is where the river meets the ocean. So when you're talking about an estuary, you're talking about fresh water and salt water at the same time. Okay, so sometimes it's going to be more fresh water, sometimes it's going to be more salt water, or sometimes in a single estuary, you can have areas that are more fresh water, you know, obviously closer up to where the freshwater river is coming in, and then you can have areas that are more salt water, which is where more um, the ocean actually meets, well, the estuary meets the ocean. So you have the actual um, ocean coming up and the tides coming in. So we're going to be talking about a couple different types of estuaries. We're going to be talking about why estuaries are so important. But um, estuaries, I can tell you right now, are really, really productively important because they are what's called nursery areas. These nursery areas are basically where lots and lots of different species go to either have their babies or at least raise their babies. Whether they have parental care or not, if you deposit your young in these kind of protected areas, you're giving it some kind of parental care. You're at least giving it a better, better shot at survival um and that's because not a lot of organisms can survive in the inner tidal oh sorry this uh estuary area where you've got fresh water and salt water um combining and mixing up remember that most organisms have a very very limited salinity range that they can live in so if you get them out of that salinity range then all of a sudden they won't be able to survive freshwater fish can't go into the oceans oceans can't go into fresh water etc so let's go ahead and start talking about estuaries and um Hopefully I won't knock my computer over. Okay. Uh-oh. Just turn my clicker on. No. All right. Well, I'm going to click that. All right. So the types of estuaries that we're going to be talking about today include the drowned river valleys, which are basically drowned rivers. So imagine that you had a river, it cut out a little valley, and then that valley flooded. So now you kind of have this area where you had a bunch of fresh water coming in, but now it's going to be almost submerged with the ocean water. Next up is a bar built estuary. So essentially like a sandbar was formed and sandbar is not like sandbar. It's like a sandbar. It's almost like a little island is trying to form as it as it, um, you know, deposits sand after sand after sand after sediment after sediment. It's kind of building up. So you build up this almost like barrier that actually keeps your fresh water from flowing directly into the um, sea and therefore creating almost like a little lagoon. Um, tectonic estuaries are basically tectonic plates that have shifted and sunk. So when they sunk, they allowed the seawater to kind of flood in. That's mixing with the natural fresh water that's coming out. And then you have, again, one of those little nice deeper estuaries. Fjords are another one. Fjords are um, basically caused by glacial retreating that have carved out these little nooks and crannies. Uh, but are really, really um, productive. So in fact, all estuaries, all estuaries, any estuary in the entire planet is going to be a very, very productive area. Some of the most productive in the entire world. People are always saying, you know, support, save our rainforest, save our rainforest, save the estuaries too. Because again, these are nursery grounds for other species and larger species that live out in the ocean. And not just in the ocean, we're talking birds, we're talking mammals, we're talking invertebrates, we're talking insects. There are so many different organisms that can actually utilize these estuary areas. So they're very, very crucially important. Starting with our first drowned river valley. So again, it's a kind of a drowned river valley. So the example here is going to be the Chesapeake Bay. It's a really big estuary that we have on the East Coast. Um, it's basically, again, uh, formed by this, this drowning of these valleys. And so you had a little valley kind of carved in and then you're going to have this influx of fresh water as well as an influx of seawater and it's good, basically going to cause these levels of water to rise and rise and rise creating this kind of little nook of mixture of fresh water and salt water known as our estuary. Okay so that's what we see right here in the Chesapeake Bay. So this whole area right here going all the way back including all these little off um, these little off areas right here, these little almost like nooks and crannies, that's all fresh water and seawater. Because this is a bay, you're going to have all of that, that seawater coming in, but all of these rivers are basically caused by fresh water coming in from the melting snows in the nearby mountains and just natural springs and stuff like that. So you're going to get a constant influx of this fresh water. 
Um, but you're also going to have a constant mixing of this, this seawater that's going right in here, which you can see right there. So the Chesapeake Bay, an example of a drowned river valley. Okay, the next up is going to be the bar built estuary. You remember any kind of sandbar, like uh, in the Florida Keys, they have a lot of sandbars. It's one of my favorite places to go. And again, this is not the bar bar. This is an actual, just kind of like a little 3D building up of sediment that creates kind of like these shallow water areas. Um, great for seagrasses. Seagrasses absolutely love this because remember, seagrasses don't grow very tall. They're usually only about that big. So they need to be in areas that are nice and shallow so that they can actually get the sunlight penetration all the way down to the bottom where they are. So any kind of anytime you have a sand bar, you're going to have a lot of uh, seagrasses. Seagrasses are great for not only food sources, but structure. Remember, structure is so important. So when we have all this structure, what you have is these little micro habitats, these micro ecosystems that lots of little things can live in. And when you're talking about um, these estuaries, you're talking about organisms that are in faunal, like little worms and crabs and stuff that are burrowing, burrowing inside the sediment. You have um, snails and stuff that are going to be crawling right along the top. You have little fishes that are going to be hiding in the blades of the grasses. You have lots of different 3D structures and areas for these organisms to live in. Um, you also have all the organisms that are going to be feeding on them as well. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, but there's a ton of birds that, that survive and thrive because of these estuaries. It's like they're stopping grounds where they know that they can consistently find food in an area, well, in a time where we're kind of destroying most of our coastal ecosystems because people want to live near the coast. So estuaries are really, really very important. Anyway, um, getting back to the barbell estuary. Remember, you're just building up a bar, right? You're building up a little accumulation of sediment, usually sand or silt, anything that's very small and silty so that it can kind of drift around. If it's too heavy and coarse, like little pebbles, they're not going to be able to kind of, you know, drift around in the water column. Um, but if it's something light that's like sand or sediment, um, I'm sorry, silt, then it can actually settle down to the bottom and then create that bar built 3D estuary. Um, now, this is going to be. Um, Basically, where was it? The lower right of the picture we just saw near the Chesapeake Bay. So again, the East Coast actually has a lot of estuaries. Um, we don't, and it's because their continental shelf is really long. So their continental shelf goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And goes. Our continental shelf slopes kind of like this. Beep. So you really need it long and flat to keep that mixture of the fresh water and the salt water. If you had it too steep, that fresh water would basically just run into the ocean and then you would just have ocean. You wouldn't have that mixture of the fresh water and salt water. You would just immediately have river or stream and then, and then ocean. Um, so it's key for the East Coast to have such a long continental shelf that gives them a lot more estuaries than we do. Um, we had a fair amount in California, but people like to live near the coast, especially in California where the weather's super nice. And so they kind of destroyed a lot of our ecosystems. We're going to see a video on... Um, um, uh, estuary uh, reconstruction here in California, which is really great. It's and it's super important. Uh, okay, so let's see. And again, right here. So this little red box can be down here. That's Cape Hatteras. That would be an example of a bar built estuary. And you can even see it. If you look right down here, you can see this line, right? That is, that's the bar. That's the sandbar. It was probably some ancient reef area and then sediment has kind of built up and built up and built up on it settling on it creating basically like a 3d wall it's like it's like almost um like la harbor la harbor and long beach harbor has that break wall and that's protecting from ocean waves coming in and, and basically getting rid of our sediment in our coast it happens all the time well a bar built estuary kind of does the same kind of thing it blocks off it creates like a 3d barrier now you have all of this seawater that's coming in here, but you don't actually have all of the marine predators because they can't really get readily like back and forth through it because it is kind of protected. So you have a really, really great marine area that is still protected, um, which is really important for, again, nursery areas. Ah, tectonic, right? Tectonic estuaries. These are basically where the tectonic plates, right, shifted and sunk. So now we have this area that they've either diverged or they've converged and then kind of crumbled in on themselves. However, they wanted to work. They basically created this kind of like sunken area um, that's recessed a little bit that now creates that will it traps some of the seawater coming in as well as some of that fresh water coming in. So it's important to always have some kind of little if you're too flat again, 
it's just going to run right in, but you need to have almost kind of a little complexity to it. And then you can actually create that uh, mixture of the fresh water and the seawater. So again, it's just the sinking of the tectonic plates. They've shifted, they've sunk, they created kind of like that little, um, that little opening or almost like little lagoon area. Um, oh, an example would be the San Francisco Bay. So that is one of, that is definitely California's largest estuary. Um, it is massive. It used to, used to be even bigger. Um, and it was always, of course, because it was an estuary, it was kind of where the river meets the land. And so it was great for shipping. And that's why people kind of used it up a lot. Um, San Francisco Bay has been historically studied for many, many years because of things like PCBs and DDTs and all of these really, really nasty um, chemicals. Because when, you know, industry first started coming up and they were using it as a harbor and they had all these ships coming in and these factories, these factories would produce all this chemical waste and they didn't know what to do with it. So they just dumped it straight into the estuary. And they're like, ah, it's big enough and it's the ocean and we're old timey and we don't know any better. So they would actually dump it into the ocean, which would create... I mean, not to miss toxic conditions for the meantime, but we're talking like 50, 60, 70 years. Those chemicals are still there. There's times where um, they'll basically put out these advisories that say, do not swim. <laughs> do not swim in the San Francisco Bay right now because because all those chemicals have been stirred up due to storms, due to dredging, due to whatever. And now the levels are just toxic and just gross. And you really, you just, you can't go in there. Um, so it's a really... You know, it's a terrible thing that we did a long time ago when we didn't know any better. We didn't know that those chemicals were going to stick around for a really, really long time, but they have. Um, and unfortunately, that was a big estuary, a huge part of California's estuary and water system and feeding the mammals and the fowls and the crabs and the invertebrates and the vertebrates. It's just, it was sad. But they are, like I said, they've been monitoring it for many, many years and they are working to restore a lot of parts of it, which is absolutely fantastic. So... Um, we're doing our job now once we learn that we kind of mess things up that we got to go back and fix them So that's what we're doing right now, which is um, which is pretty cool So yay, we're and again, we're gonna see a video on that at the end of the lecture today on, on restoration of estuaries because they are really it's very very important All right, let's get to fjords if you guys have ever seen frozen or frozen 2 now, which just came out um, I'm sure you guys have heard of the fjord right and the fjord again it's going to be uh, and things like Alaska and Norway and basically like the, the frozen north of our planet. Um, and that's because these are cut out by glaciers. So the melting glaciers will actually cut out kind of these parts of these lands and create these little like these little pockets. Um, so these deep channels allow the water to kind of like go way, way back into the land. And that allows for that seawater to flush in and the fresh water, and then you have the mixing again. The shorter they are, the worse they are. The bigger and wider and longer they are, the better. So these long, basically like um, channels that have gone way, way in the back because everything was frozen, uh, and then slowly starts to melt out, slowly starts to erode those rocks out and cut out those deep, deep valleys. Um, they go for really long periods of uh, long distances and that allows for that mixing of the seawater and the freshwater So we get the nice big healthy long estuary that we want and again that would be in things like Alaska and Norway um, Frozen I think was set in Norway Something like that. So yeah, just think frozen Fjord and it's fun to say fjord All right, so here's a picture of a fjord you guys can google all of course more examples of these different estuaries pictures of them, what they look like, how they're a little bit different. We're not going to go into too much about the detail except for what I, you know, what I covered. Basically just know the origin of where they came from and the differences between them. Okay. All right. So we already kind of touched up on a little bit of um, the development of these estuaries. So we want something that's flat, not, not super flat because then what's going to happen is the water is going to dry up. It's not going to actually be able to go anywhere. So we want it just at a little bit of an angle, but it needs to be high enough off of sea level so that it doesn't just flood with seawater, but it doesn't just dry up from fresh water. So it kind of has to be in this like perfect location. And so that's why not every single area is going to have an estuary. Um, they're really only, you know, spaced out sporadically, especially here in California. And like I said, we did have a lot more back in the day, like Culver City, all of Culver City, that whole area in Lincoln, all the way down to, was it like Marina Del Rey, um, all that area, that was all one giant estuary. But like, uh, like again, people use estuaries 
as harbors, especially because they're already kind of half dug out. You know, these they can get really close to land and even sometimes upriver, if they're gonna, you know, take their ships and trade and do commerce and stuff upriver, they want an area that goes as close to land as possible. And so these estuaries were just natural choices for things like harbors and, and places like that. But luckily that whole area south of Marina del Rey right in between Playa del Rey and Marina del Rey is a natural estuary and therefore they've kind of restored it. So even though we did kind of dry it up for a while, they've gone back and they've gone and restored it. And now if you drive through, it is protected area. It's protected for things like birds and mammals and reptiles and, and any animal that needs an estuary. Um, so it's really important to conserve, at least to restore areas that we now know are so important um, to their former glory. All right, so we want a nice, long continental shelf, not super steep sloping. Um, you know, the longer, the wider, the better. And that will be, that will give us more area that we can actually have that estuary. Cause again, too steep, it's not going to work too flat. It's not going to work. Certainly uphill. It's not going to work. Um, <laughs> so again, that's, what, that's the area that would work best for an estuary, or at least which would probably have an estuary there already. Um, salinity. So remember we talked about whether you're closer to the ocean, you're going to have a higher salinity, whether you're closer to the freshwater, you're going to have a lower salinity, whether there's a big storm, if there's a super big storm, like it's, I'm looking outside, it's raining right now. Um, if in, when it rains like now and it pours all this fresh water, like all this fresh water comes and collects from offshore and then gets pulled into the estuary, maybe something that was, had a salinity of like 10 or 15, Maybe now that that influx of fresh water, maybe it's all the way down to like three or four, right? So that salinity changes is kind of a big deal that you have to deal with. Um, not to mention the fact that um, you're already dealing with lower salinities, whether it was already 15. I mean, the normal parts per thousand is 35 in the ocean. So you're already at almost half of that. So you do have to deal with these like intense salinity differences um, if you're gonna even go anywhere near an estuary. Um, what else? In dry years, so maybe you're in, you know, you're an estuary organism and you live at the mouth of the river. So most of the time it's pretty fresh water. But what if we're going through a drought year? The opposite of a rainy year, right? Now you get almost no fresh water influx. So now you're getting more ocean water. So your salinity is a lot higher. So organisms really, really have to deal with this. And remember, there's a difference between urihaline and stenohaline. And urihaline, an organism is an uh, a urihaline organism is an organism who can tolerate a wide range of salinities. So they can live, say, in an estuary, or at least go into an estuary like a bull shark to, like, pup. Um, whereas a stenohaline organism is very, very narrow ranged in their um, salinities. So, like, a fresh, completely freshwater fish um, could not be in an estuary because it's way too high salinity for them. Uh, and vice versa with the ocean fish. Um, depth usually has something to do with salinity as well. I mean, salinity essentially is dissolved sediments, which are probably going to settle closer to the bottom. Um, it's also denser. So, um, seawater is denser than freshwater because again, it has stuff in it. So it's going to settle towards the bottom of the estuary, whereas the top of the estuary is going to be more freshwater. So if you are, say, a freshwater organism living in an estuary, maybe you're going to stay closer to the top of the water, whereas you're a marine organism, maybe you're going to stay closer to the bottom of, um, of the estuary, and that's because salinities are going to be slightly different, even depending on, on depth of the water. Um, so we, here we have a couple different graphs of what's going on here. So um, in this case, we have not a ton of fresh water influx coming in. So we really only have it right at the, the mouth of the river and that you're gonna see a very, very kind of sharp gradient. So it goes from fresh water, just basically right here at the mouth of the river to very, very quickly all just seawater. And so this would be the same salinity as the ocean. Um, so you don't have a lot of mixing here. So this wouldn't be in a great area for um, a estuary because you don't have that really steep, long sloping, uh, environment, you basically are just too steep, so it instantly goes from fresh water to salt water, and you get that big influx of the salt water. So if we were to actually look at an estuary that's a little bit shallower, meaning a little bit steeper, so it takes longer for it to get deeper into the ocean, what you see is you see a much more distinct gradient, right? These areas are very, very distinct as they go down, so now you can live here and maybe a little bit of salinity and a little bit more over here. And okay, so this is a little bit more close to seawater, but you have this whole area to survive in. 
um, as an estuary instead of just having this little tiny freshwater influx area right there and then just having most of that area just be straight up seawater. So again, we want a nice slow sloping, we want good freshwater influx, right? Not enough freshwater influx and you're pretty much just gonna be the ocean, right? You're not gonna have a lot of that estuary, it's just gonna be mostly ocean. All right, what else do we have here? So again, Uri Haline is a wide tolerance range, meaning you can survive in this or this or this or this or this or this or whatever big, big salinity range versus Steno Haline, which is very gonna be um, very narrow. So you can really only survive in a little bit of um, uh, salinity changes. Uh, because of the salinity, the changes, we, uh, we learned early on in the semester, hopefully you guys remember this, that if you are a freshwater fish, you have a problem with too much fresh water, right? You have too much fresh water coming in. So you are constantly, you don't drink water at all, you're just absorbing water because you're naturally surrounded by this water. So you're gonna be constantly just like peeing to get rid of all this extra, extra water. You're just gonna be like, oh my God, I need the salts, but I don't need all this extra water because it's just gonna be going through osmosis just into your cells. If you are a salt water fish or marine fish, What's going to happen is the opposite, right? You have too much salt now. You need to get rid of all that extra salt. So now you're going to be peeing excessive salt out, but you have almost no fresh water. So what you're going to be doing is you're actually going to be extracting that salt from the fresh water, keeping the water and getting rid of the salt. So it's kind of a whole different physiological response to your environment. So when it comes to some of these organisms, they actually have to switch from one to the other or sometimes only those urihaline organisms can do it. The stenohalines cannot. Um, so osmoregulation is really, really important for some of these organisms if you're stenohaline. Um, otherwise, if you're an osmoconformer, you're just going to kind of deal with... Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so an osmoregulator, remember osmo means water, and regulator means you're controlling your water concentration. So if you are a urihaline organism, you can basically do this osmoregulation. Um, if you need more fresh water, you drink more fresh water. If you need to get rid of your salts, you get rid of your excess salts. You're basically just kind of controlling your internal water concentration. Now, if you are a osmoconformer, you're basically at the mercy of whatever the environment is. So if the environment is super salty, you're going to be super salty. If um, the environment's not super salty, if it's pure fresh water, you're going to be pure fresh water. So you also have to deal with that because now you're still getting that fresh water influx in. So you almost do have to switch and pick and choose. Um, so instead of keeping like, no matter what the conditions are, so that would be more like a bull shark. Like whatever conditions are, the bull sharks kind of like deal with them and they kind of take it. But one of these, um, uh, one of these other, these Osmo conformers would basically have to like, oh my God, I'm dealing with this salt right now. I need to switch my mechanism up. Or what they can do is if they're not gonna do it um, physically, like if they're not capable of going from that fresh water to the salt water, going from drinking um, salts instead of fresh water to drinking fresh waters instead of salts, whatever, if you can't do that switch physically, what you have to do is you have to do it behaviorally. So that means when conditions are optimal, you kind of follow the conditions that are optimal for you. So you are more on the freshwater side and there's a big storm, great, you're gonna go more towards the riverbed, right? Because that's where the fresh water is gonna be. If it's you're more towards the marine side and there's a freshwater flood coming in, you're going to go more towards the ocean side because you're like, man, I can't handle all that fresh water. I'm going to go closer to the ocean side or I'm going to go deeper in the estuary to where the conditions are more optimal to me. So that's the difference between an osmoconformer and osmoregulator. Just like the thermoregulators and thermoconformers we talked about, um, it's basically are you able to control your own um, salt concentration, uh, sorry, water concentration and therefore salt concentration or are you not? And therefore you would either have to do it um, behaviorally or you just can't live there. Okay. All right. Um, so again, these are the salinity ranges for different species. So what you can see right here, this is a Uri haline species. Um, and you can see all the blue is where they can survive. Okay, so yes, there's they kind of narrow right here when it gets to almost zero salinity. That's because it's basically pure fresh water. Um, so they can still just survive right on that little middle line right there where there's a little narrow range of those uh, marine species. Because again, they are marine species. These are not freshwater organisms. They're marine species who can tolerate being really close to them. But then as you can see right here, it widens up greatly um, when you actually go to about five, between five and 10, 
parts per thousand and that's because these guys can survive there's a lot more organisms that can survive between 5 and 10 all the way up to 35. If we look at stenohaline marine organisms meaning they're just marine right they have to wait until it gets almost up to 35 like you there's almost nobody anywhere here right because they're stenohaline they have a very very narrow range. Um, brackish water, brackish water is kind of like standing water, kind of still water, um, probably a little bit more salty on the bottom and a little more fresh water on top, but they don't really have that influx of either, um, either that seawater or the fresh water. It's just kind of like standing, almost gross water. Yeah. Um, so again, it is kind of marine, it, sorry, it is kind of fresh water, it is kind of marine, uh, but there's not a ton of organisms that can survive in there. And then same kind of thing here, you have your freshwater organisms which really can only survive in fresh, fresh water. And again, there's a few of them that can go up to about 15, because that would be those estuarine species, right? They're living in the middle of the estuary, it's probably gonna be more like 15. Um, usually anywhere between about 10 and 15, sometimes up to 20. Um, so you can see that there's a different abundance of organisms that can that can either survive because they're stenohaline, urohaline, or um, brackish in fresh water. Okay, so we have some osmo regulators, we have some osmo conformers. On the top right here, you see a perfect osmo regulator, meaning osmo regulating. They are regulating their water concentration so it does not say this, it does not change, right? No matter what the outside environment is, they're keeping their nice water concentration perfectly um, regulated. If you see right here, we have a freshwater eel and a Chinook salmon. Remember that the freshwater eel and the salmon are both. Um, Catadromous and anadromous, which means that they go from seawater to freshwater or freshwater to seawater, depending on which one which, um, to mate, remember, to reproduce. So these guys would have to be able to osmoregulate because they are, they are going from one to the other to have their babies to reproduce. If they weren't able to do that, they, weren't, they wouldn't be able to reproduce. Um, so those guys are, as you can see, just like the example right here, those perfect osmoregulators, nice line going all the way across. Um, now we have a polychaete worm, which is an osmoconformer. So you can see right here, he goes basically right along this osmoconforming line, meaning when it's low, his concentration is low. When the salinity is high, his concentration is high. So he's basically just at the mercy of the environment, but he can still be able to survive um, in both of those conditions. You can see he kind of drops off a little bit right there because it's like too fresh water for him. But then it increases and nice, boom, osmoconformer right there as our polychaete worm. All right, so uh, remember that these uh, areas aren't just really, really great for animals, right? They're really, really great for plants and algaes as well. So there's a whole community of these different plants and algaes that live in these estuaries because they too can deal with these salinity changes. Remember, you're usually a marine organism, including plants and animals, um, uh, sorry, plants and algaes, or your freshwater organism. So these guys can deal with these um, increase in salinities in a variety of different ways, which is really cool. So um, flowering plants, things like salt marshes, mangrove forests, stuff like that, they do live in estuaries. They can live in estuaries because they have these little salt glands that they can produce. Um, it's not really a salt gland, I suppose. It's more like a salt pod. Uh, and so what they're doing, I guess no, it is a salt gland. Um, do you salt gland? Um, it's a salt gland because what they do is they basically produce, well, they remove the salts from the water. So they're drinking the salt water or the estuine water. They're removing the salts from the water and they're basically keeping the water and then taking the salts and kind of packing them away in either the vacuoles or these little pods that they'll eventually release. So what you do is you kind of like store all your salts in this one little place and you're like, hey, these salts are really bad for me, but it's okay because they're all right here. And then what you're going to do is you're going to pop them off and then you're going to let them float away. And that's the removing of the salt for you so that you don't actually have to keep that in your, um, in your body. Um, what else? Ooh, Spartina. Spartina or pickleweed, which is usually common in salt marshes, sometimes around lakes and um, stuff like that. So what you see is that there's almost these little like these little like pockets of them. Um, same kind of thing as like the little pods, depending on the different species, you're either gonna drop a pod, you're gonna physically release it out of um, um, an opening that you may have, like with the salt glands, or you're just basically gonna put it in one part of your body and be like, mm, we're just gonna lock that up over there. And we're gonna keep them, but we're just gonna keep storing them over there and we're just gonna keep them in that side of the body. So that the rest of your body stays nice and 
um, stays nice and fresh water, um, but you kind of keep all your salts in one place to kind of store them and keep them out of the way so that they don't, again, damage your whole system. Okay, so let's talk about estuary substrate. Remember substrate that means body, uh, bottom. So we're gonna be talking about the different types of substrate bottoms. Now usually when we talk about estuaries, because you have such an influx of the fresh water coming in, most of the time they're going to be very sandy or silty bottomed. If you've ever been to an estuary, really, really fine silts um, all along the, the bottom, which makes great soil, great sediment, really like rich and productive. Um, sometimes anoxic, right? If you go, if it's too silty, remember we talked about anoxic last week. Um, if you go too far down, you actually don't get any oxygen down there. So the only thing that can grow are those um, uh, aerobic bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, which don't like oxygen, but produces like nasty, like CO2 methane stuff. Super gross. Um, so yeah, you can get anoxic if you get too far down and if it's too silty, like too muddy or too, too silty. And then yeah, it will get, um, it will get a little gross. Um, so again, you're going to have mud, sand, or silt. Uh, it does shift a lot, especially if you've got, you know, tides coming in, if you have storms coming in, um, all that can change your topography of your bottom. So you really, you don't have a lot of hard substrates in these estuaries. So you don't have a ton of things for these organisms like barnacles or um, mussels and stuff to grow on. Um, so they really don't have a lot in these estuaries because there's not a lot of substrate to attach onto. Some organisms have figured out a way to get over that, though, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And then we talked about the anoxic, um, anoxic sediment, which is really gross and stinky. It smells like rotting eggs. If you've ever been to a beach or an estuary or anything, and you're like, what's that rotten egg smell? Yeah, it's, mm -hmm, it's anoxic. It's bacteria. Okay, uh, talking about water temperature, remember that sometimes if you're gonna have fresh water coming in, you're gonna get that influx of fresh water. That fresh water could be melting ice from the mountains, nearby mountains, which means it's going to be really cold. So sometimes you get these really drastic temperature changes just like the intertidal zone that we learned about last week. Just like the intertidal zone we learned about last week, if you have uh, not a lot of influx of any kind of water, you're gonna have evaporation. If you have evaporation, you're going to get those temperatures increasing drastically, right? That's how evap evaporation works. You increase the temperature and eventually you're going to have evaporation come off. That's going to mess with things like the temperature. So now you're losing, right? You're going to get this drastic temperature fluctuation from this really, really cold um, marine water or uh, mountain waters that are coming in and then you're going to get maybe these warmer ocean waters coming in, maybe vice versa. Um, so again, just like the intertidal zone, it is something that you have to worry about, something that you have to consider um, if you're going to be able to try and survive there. Um, oh, especially when water levels are really low, you could get that super sunny day and now maybe it's 100 degrees outside and you're in this much water and now you're 100 degrees. And then nighttime comes and now there's no hot water and all it is is that cold mountain water coming in and now you're 40 degrees. And so you went through a 60 degree temperature difference in the you know in a day in the matter of an hour or so or a couple hours or so so just like the intertidal water temperature fluctuates a lot in these shallow shallow near land areas water clarity we already talked about the sediment right we got all the silt and this mud and the sediment that's coming down from these rivers and these streams and this upsource great for things like minerals not great for things like algae right or photosynthetic plants so what's going to happen is those sediments are going to settle on top of your plants or your algae and it's going to block you from doing photosynthesis. So a lot of the time in estuaries you don't have really good water quality. In fact, you almost never do, also because of that soft, silty um, bottom. So all it takes is a little thing to stir it up and all of a sudden now that all those really tiny particles are back up in the water column floating around blocking your water clarity. So if you are an uh, intertidal organism that lives in one of these areas, you do have to deal with very, very bad water quality. I would not want to, I would not want to dive in an estuary, <laughs> like diving a harbor. It's like, can't see anything. Um, oh, okay. So for primary productivity, because we have such bad water quality, we don't have a ton of algae. So really what we have is some of those things, like I said, like the, um, salt marshes, the mangroves and your seagrasses. So seagrasses are kind of a big one. So in this case, the flowering plants, the anthophytas, they kind of take over and they're like, mm, we do a little bit better here than everybody else. 
So we're gonna kind of take over the primary production of the estuary, but there's still enough going on, especially nearby, um, you know, the salt marsh organisms, uh, plants and stuff that aren't living quite in the salt water, but really close to it. They still have to deal with that increased salinity in the in the soil. Um, so those are still considered estuarine plants. Estuarian? Estuarian? Sounds like a quite sounding like aquarium now. No. <laughs> equine like horses no just kidding all right I digress um so yeah okay salt marshes flowering plants more so than algae in these areas which is not what we're going to see once we actually get to the ocean ocean that's going to be all algae's game okay um lots of different communities that live in an uh, estuary especially depending on the different time of year like I said this is a nursery area so you've got migrating birds you've got um, fishes and sharks that are going to be laying um, and having their babies at certain times of the year. You've got uh, invertebrates that are going to be doing the same thing. Spring's kind of like mating season for everybody. It doesn't have to just be a vertebrate animal. Um, so it really depends on the season. It depends on the actual location, but it is very diverse group. And so you have a lot of these different species living in the same kind of area, which is, um, which is pretty cool. And again, a healthy ecosystem. You always want a big, diverse group of organisms living there. The more organisms you have, the better and healthier your ecosystem. The less organisms you have, the less healthy your ecosystem is. So always want the top number of organisms present. Um, what else we got? Oh, some of these guys are only in the estuaries uh, during certain parts of their life. So if you're talking about one of those migrating animals that is maybe going to fresh water from the ocean or going to the ocean for fresh water from fresh water, um, they're only there part of the time of the year. Also, if you're pupping, if you're a shark and you're pupping and you're just dropping off your babies and you're taking off, you're only going to be there for a little while. Um, if you're one of those shark pups, you know, say a leopard shark pup or a bulk shark pup, you don't live in the estuary your entire life. You just pup in the estuary. So when you're old enough, eventually you will crawl out, crawl, <laughs> you will swim out of there and then you'll go live your life in the ocean. So a lot of these organisms only spend part of their time there, but it's a very important part. Um... If you don't have the nursery areas, you're not going to have the you're not going to have the adults, right? If you don't have the babies, you're not going to get the adults. So not having these nursery areas means you're going to lose all those adults. No matter how much fishing regulations or collecting regulations you have on the adult species, if you don't have any babies, you're not going to have any adults. So it's always important to keep an eye on the babies and and the entire ecology, like from start to finish of their life and and. Um, figure out if, if there's a time in their life that we're kind of ruining it. Like same thing with like breeding areas. Like if we'd wipe out all breeding areas, like where are they going to go to breed? We protected the adults, we protected the juveniles, but we don't protect where they, where they actually mate. So things to consider, things to consider. All right. So here's an example of, again, an organism in this case of fish who is going to live its adult life out here in the ocean. It's going to travel into the estuary, even sometimes way far up into the estuary to lay its eggs or have live birth or however this fish is going to do it. And then this, again, this larval, this juvenile is going to spend time in the estuary before eventually becoming large enough to make it out into the ocean and on its own. Um, because again, the estuaries have very little predators compared to the ocean, open ocean. So once you are established enough and when you're large enough and you feel like you can protect yourself enough, then you'll actually venture out into the open ocean to again, live your life in the open ocean in the, um, where there's more food and there's more space and stuff like that. The water's clearer, nicer. No. All right. Um, so we already talked a little bit about salt marshes. Well, let's go into them again. Um, remember that basically this is just the vegetation area around the estuary. So most of the time, estuaries are going to be very, very shallow. You're going to get plants all the way around it, almost like, um, like a marsh. So think of like marsh plants that are reeds and stuff that are growing right along the outside edges, um, almost touching the water, but not quite touching water, but a little bit touching the water. And again, they're dealing with the increase in salinity, um, but they can survive with that increase, uh, increase in salinity and therefore they can live in an area where most other organisms would not be able to, including other plants. Um, so Spartina is one of those um, uh, really, really common ones. Again, that's pickle weed. Um, kind of looks like little pickles with like a little weed. You should actually Google it. I don't think I have a picture of it. Ah, sort of. You can't really see it really good here, but um, Google it. It's, it's Spartina. It's really, it's cool. Um, 
So that's going to be, again, for most of the estuaries, especially here in California, we're going to have that Spartina. Um, Juncus, or basically Needle Rush, um, it's going to be in areas with, like, low salinity, so you can think almost kind of upper, closer towards the river and farther away from the ocean. That's where you're actually going to get that Juncus. Um, not so much like Spartina. Spartina does pretty well all the way around it, but sometimes get out-competed by Juncus if it's farther up in the freshwater section because um, Spartina can survive in higher salinities and so therefore doesn't even compete with Juncus up there because it's like, ah, I have a wider range anyway, so I'm going to go live down here. So again, depending on the depth, that's kind of what you can see right here. You might see different, um, this is Salicornia, that's Salicornia, the pickleweed. Um, and then you're going to have your Spartina right here, which is your cord grass. And then as you move your way down here, this is another species of Spartina. So depending whether you're way up on the shore or farther down on the shore, um, it's going to kind of like the intertidal. It's almost like a zonation, but in this case, it comes to flowering plants zonation. And then once you all the way get all the way down here, this is going to be your eelgrass, right? And this is only ever going to be um, exposed to the tide just a little bit at the lowest tide. Because uh, eelgrass is very, it's like grass grass, you know, it's not really resilient. It can't really survive under a lot of conditions and therefore it can't survive out in the open air. It's too hot, it's too dry, they just, they just don't do well. So they basically will like have like little fingers like touching up right above the tip of the, the water, right, in the low tide. But most of the time they're going to be completely covered. But not too deep, because if they're too deep, too deep with that terrible water quality you're not going to be able to get the photosynthesis you need and therefore you're not going to be able to get the sunlight you need and therefore you know the drill all right so here's some animals that uh are going to be living in the in faunal or so in faunal organisms i don't know i did finger quotes that they are in faunal um but these are some of the in faunal organisms you have some of your mud snails your moon snails like we saw in the inner title um, you've got your nerises. This is a very common sandworm. This is one of those um, polychaetes that we looked at in lab. You've got other species of worms. Worms are really common here. So are clams, um, little shrimp, crabs, stuff like that. Very, very common, especially like your burrowing clams right here. Your little ghost shrimp digs a little burrow, hides inside, pokes its way out. This guy, this is the fat innkeeper worm. Do you guys remember the really, really funny picture of the worm? Sorry, the worm, the mollusks, the shellus a placophoras. The, it's just, I wish I could find that picture. It's just me cracking up holding one of these things. Yeah. It's innkeeper worms. All right, so moving on from those um, salt marshes to mangroves. Mangroves, again, can have, um, essentially, if you think of like Florida, almost like the swamp, like Everlades kind of thing. That's kind of what we're looking at because you are getting those influx of fresh waters from the mainland in the form of springs and stuff like that but you also have the nearby ocean surrounding it and making it a really salty environment so saltwater um estuaries sorry mangrove estuaries are really common especially say in like florida and sometimes in um like louisiana and georgia and stuff like that um so these are called mangroves or mangals um basically anywhere warm you're tropical you're subtropical they don't like it cold like, we don't have mangroves out here in California because it would just be too cold. Uh, and they do replace salt marshes. So we have salt marshes here in California. Bodega Bay up north is a really big one, a really great one. They have an amazing tidal fluctuation. It goes out like six feet. So something that was six feet underwater in the morning is exposed by the afternoon. It's pretty cool. Um, but we don't have any mangrove forests out here, at least not in California. You can go to, say, Florida or the tropical areas of um, the East Coast to go see those. And that's exactly what you can see right here. Remember the mangroves sticking out with these long roots. Those are prop roots. They're going to prop themselves up out of the water so that they don't get too much salt. And then they basically have that salt gland that's going to allow them to just release the salt as they go. And so they don't have to worry about that. Some more mangroves. Sorry, that's mangals. Mangroves, mangals. Let's go down here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um... So this would be a little food web of what's going on in the mangrove forest. So again, you're going to have your salt marsh, which is basically going to be um, in the temperate regions only, but you're going to have your mangrove forest. 
in the tropical regions, but they're basically working out the same. You're either going to have the salt marshes or the mangroves, depending on whether what your temperature is. But normally what you're going to have is you're going to have these open water channels, some shallower areas, some deeper areas. Um, you're going to have small fishes, you're going to have bird species, you're going to have invertebrates, you're going to have lots living nearby. So very complex food webs, which you can see down below here. You have lots of carnivores, deposit filters, feeder filters, um, sorry, filter feeders, um, and your detritivores and all that primary production in the form of your anthophytas or your um, flowering plants. Um, we already talked about... Um, I think we already talked about nematophores in, in mangrove forest when we were talking about anthophytus way early on in the semester. So remember, this is not nematocyst. This is nematophores, not with an N, but with a PN. Yes, I know it gets terribly confusing, but vocab words, you have to know them. Um, basically, these are just vertical root extensions of what they're allowing the organism to do or the mangrove to do is if the tides are high and they need to do some kind of gas exchange because remember they're doing photosynthesis which means they're producing oxygen and oxygen is toxic to plants they don't need it they don't want it this buildup causes all sorts of bad things to happen so what they need to do is they need to get rid of it as fast as possible it's just like us we don't we can't want to accumulate co2 that's very bad for us so by having these vertical root extensions what they can do is they can do gas exchange even when underwater so even when the roots and the rest of the organism is actually underwater, these guys have these little, again, kind of like, like little gas chambers are going to be poking up, allowing them like straws. Like imagine those, remember those cartoons when someone's hiding under the water and they just have the straw and they're just breathing through the little straw. Same kind of thing like that. That's what these guys are doing. And that's what you can see right here. Basically these little root extensions are propping up so that they can do that gas exchange, propping up out of the soil, out of the water so that it can actually, um, Breathe or respire because they're yeah, not really breathing, but they're respiring. Seagrass beds, we already talked about them. They like it shallow. They like it warm. Um, they need good water clarity because, again, they they're they can't go. They're they're not tall, right? They're little. So it's it's either got to be really shallow so that the sun can penetrate, or if it's deep, it's got to be really clear. So they like it clear. They like it shallow. They like it warm. Um. Yeah, you usually got to have better than average um, clarity for them to actually grow. So not every estuary is going to have seagrasses. Usually in the shallower areas they're going to, um, but it could be if there's not a lot of shallow areas, if it's all just those deep channels, then you're not going to have almost any. So important even for diversity to have seagrasses. Oyster reefs are really cool. So remember how I told you that there's not a lot of hard structure in an estuary? So there's not a lot of places that organisms who need hard structure can actually survive. If you're a barnacle, you're probably not going to do well in an estuary. So some of these oysters, what they have done is they're called aggregate settlers, and so are barnacles. They release out this like chemical pheromone almost that attracts other oysters. So really all it takes is one oyster kind of getting like a semi good footing on something sort of hard. And then another oyster is going to land on him and settle and then it'll land on him and settle and land on him and settle. And so essentially what you end up doing is you build a reef out of living organisms. Remember, just like a coral reef is built off of coral, which are living organisms. You can do the same thing with an oyster. So as, so as long as they just attach to something little, a little bit of something, and you build another one on it, build another one on it, build another one, eventually they become a big 3D structure. They become their own reef. And then more can fill on, up, build off of them and extend and extend and extend. And eventually you can have massive oyster reefs. In fact, these oyster reefs can be so big that they actually change the flow of water. They can slow the flow of water down. Um, they can, again, which would slow the sediment coming around being disturbed, which would increase the water clarity. They're also filter feeders. They're also going to increase your water clarity because they're filtering out the food out of the water, out of the suspended water. So you guys, you have these like amazing machines that aren't even machines, they're living organisms that are used to actually purify and make re these reefs even better, even larger, even better, which means even more little niches, which means even more species present, which means even more food, which means more birds, which means more plants, which means it just means more everything. So these oyster reefs are absolutely fantastic. It's kind of like the Sargasso Sea. When you don't have structure, you kind of make it up as you go and you build your own structure. So that's what these little guys are doing. Um, 
And it's it's just amazing. And sometimes the only hard substrate in the entire estuary is an oyster reef. So that's what you can see right here. If you look, there's actually a channel on either side right here, but right in the middle, oyster reef. And those are, I mean, millions and millions of oysters. And they're all doing their filter feeding. They're all making the water quality better. They've all created little nooks and stuff. You'll have little crabs living in between them. You'll have little snails living on top of them. You'll have the predators of these guys eating them. Um, you'll support local communities like sea otters and stuff. Pfft, they know how to open these guys up. Yeah, so now you just have an abundance of food and they're filtering out toxins, they're filtering out sediments, they're just doing all this filtering and you're creating a, such a better ecosystem because of this natural mechanism, this natural organism just being present creates a better ecosystem for all the other organisms there. Pretty cool. I'm Erica Zavaleta and this is Ecosystems of California. Estuaries are the places where rivers meet the sea in an intermingling tidal system of fresh and salty water. California has not had very many estuaries in its history because of its steep and rocky coastline. And it's also lost some of its estuarine systems to land use change, drainage, and viking. Nevertheless, California is still home to some spectacular estuarine ecosystems. Some of them are notable for their size, the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary once drained 40% of the state's area and itself extended over an area the size of Rhode Island. Others are notable for the ecosystem services that they provide. And one example of that is where we're visiting today at Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. This reserve provides a variety of ecosystem services ranging from wildlife habitat for migratory birds, marine mammals, and rearing sharks and fishes to services like filtering nitrogen and phosphorus and other pollutants from agricultural runoff that enters the slough from the agricultural landscape upstream before it enters the open ocean. Today we're visiting Elkhorn Slough Reserve and we're going to start out with Kerstin Watson who works with the reserve on a variety of restoration and research projects. Estuaries have a variety of habitat types that are almost as different as grasslands and forests and alpine systems, they change really dramatically along an elevation of the tide. So highest up, we have salt marshes, which are some of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. Below those are the mud flats, full of worms and crustaceans and small clams that feed migratory shorebirds and fish and marine mammals. And then below that are the channels and creeks, which remain full of standing water all the time. Estuaries have been the places that people come to live because the land is so productive in the floodplain around rivers where they run into the ocean and agriculture is really important in this region. The lands are very productive. For instance, farms around the Elkhorn Slough region supply something like 20% of the strawberries for the whole nation. But agriculture has had some strong effects on our estuarine ecosystems. For instance, the Salinas River used to run into Elkhorn Slough providing the estuary fresh water, but it was diverted to prevent flooding of, of floodplain fields. Also, groundwater has been used really extensively, and so we don't have these seeps that give us rushes and sedges on the edges of our salt marshes anymore. And probably the biggest impact has been through diking and draining. Something like 50% of the estuary has been diked and drained, and parts of the estuary and wetland used directly for agriculture. A final major impact is from agricultural runoff, pollution from the farm fields enters the system and there are pesticides and herbicides and especially nutrients, fertilizers, that fertilize the estuary and so they grow algae. 
too much of it, and that's bad for our estuary system. It can decrease the oxygen at nighttime to levels that fish and other animals can't tolerate. Thousands of visitors come to Elkhart Slough from all over the world and just from the surrounding area to see the shorebirds up close, to kayak among sea otters, to experience estuarine ecosystems. And we want to conserve and restore these ecosystems as a legacy for future generations of visitors. We're really excited about the Tidal Marsh Restoration Project. It's the first major marsh restoration project in this estuary, which has lost something like 50% of its salt marsh over the past 150 years. So salt marshes occupy a really narrow elevational range in the tidal frame. If they're too high, they dry out. If they're too low, they drown. During the history of Elkhorn Slough, when marshes were diked and drained and used for cattle grazing or for farming crops, the soils in those areas dried out and shrunk like your kitchen sponge. And so later on, when nature reserves came in and returned the tidal exchange, the salt marsh didn't return. There were high mud flats and, and lagoons in those areas because the soils were too low. So what we're gonna do is use beneficial reuse of sediment from another project that generated sediment and build the elevation back up to where it needs to be to sustain healthy salt marsh. And not only that, we're gonna go a little bit higher to make sure the system is resilient in the face of sea level rise. So hopefully, a few decades from now, the two sides of this former dike will look the same. What are some of the ecosystem services that a healthy marsh like this provides? Yeah, there's a whole variety, but as two examples, one is to provide habitat for wildlife, such as the sea otters that use these creeks for foraging and haul out on the salt marshes. At the other end of the spectrum is an ecosystem service that potentially has global consequences. It's the blue carbon function of salt marshes, and that's that salt marshes are able to capture an unusually high amount of carbon dioxide from the air in their living plant tissues and then bury it in the sediments of the marsh. We have some cores that go back to salt marshes from 5,000 years ago, but for this study, we're really focusing on the top layer. We've been measuring the biomass of the plants per meter square and what's in them on top so we can quantify how much carbon is captured in the plants themselves in the salt marsh. And then we've been taking sediment cores, 30 to 50 centimeters of sediment from the marsh to measure how much carbon is actually buried. The great thing about salt marshes is that it's buried forever because as water levels rise each year, the salt marsh grows higher and new layers of carbon are buried in the salt marsh every year. Thanks so much for showing us around, Kristen. Yeah, thank you for coming. We're very hopeful that through conservation and education and research, we can take care of these special estuarine ecosystems. We're out on the main channel of Elkhorn Slough today with Ron Eby. Ron is a citizen scientist who's worked at the slough for over a decade now, focused on work involving the sea otters colonized the slough in the last 25 years. Ron, thanks so much for having us out. Oh, I'm glad to have you here. We're just in the very beginning part of the slough, so we've only gone about a mile and a half so far, but you can see all the wild life that we got to see, and it's really quite impressive. I started this by kayaking for Team Ocean, and one of the things in particular was different from the training that I've had was we were seeing what the otters were doing, and we saw that the otters often were holding out on the beach, mainly at night. I had a friend, Robert Scholes, and I decided we'd start trying to see how much they were foraging there. At that time, we weren't citizen scientists at all. We were just naturalists observing something. But what was really fortunate is we had a scientist take us under her wing. And she told us what we needed to record, how to record it, how to do it really in a scientific way. And what we found is that the otters in the harbor, most of them, 85%, were foraging out in the bay, so they weren't really coming down to this area. But they were using it as a refuge. So the colder it got and the more windy it got, the more miserable we were, the more otters we saw. We captured 20 otters, put transmitters in them, so we can really determine scientifically using the same methods that are done in the ocean, how much time they spend foraging, how much time they spend resting. And because we have those radio signals that we can track them, 
The debtors can do what we call activity budgets, where we follow them for 12 hours a day. The other thing we do is foraging budgets, and that's where we monitor exactly what they're eating. So we time as soon as they come up with a prey item, how much time they spend handling it, whether they use a tool to open it, how much time they spend eating it, how much time on the surface grooming before they dive again, and then how long it takes them to come up with the next prey item. And by measuring the prey size, what the prey type is, we can see what the caloric demands are to do that effort of getting that prey. And by measuring those animals that we catch, we know what the caloric gain is. So we can see how easy it is for them. And we found that it's much easier for them to meet their caloric needs here in that one slough than it is out in the ocean. You can just imagine out in the ocean, her mother with a pup, she's got to dive down, leave the pup on the surface, find the forest, come back up, find her pup, then eat her prey. In the meantime, she's got all the waves. But as you can see here, it's just an ideal habitat for the otters. The really cool thing is, the otters are good for up on slope. They eat the crabs that are in the yieldbread. By getting rid of the crabs, the Taylor sea hare can survive. What we have here is a Taylor sea hare. This is a small one that can get up to be about the size of my little finger. But you can see, it has been foraging up and down this piece of eelgrass. They go up and down the blades of eelgrass and keep eating all the microalgae off. And when they get the eelgrass clear like this, then it can photosynthesize. These blades here, Taylor sea hares have not cleaned them, and you can see all this microalgae. We have so much excess nutrients in here that the microalgae just flourishes like crazy. The only thing that keeps them in check are these little critters. Eelgrass is perfect for up on slope. Slows down the current, which enables more sediment to come out. Our ebb tides are stronger than our flood tides, so we're losing sediment. The eelgrass beds help hold that sediment, and it's an ideal nursery. It's a habitat for all kinds of fishes that are out in the oceans. They grow right here in these eelgrass beds. Ironically, bringing the top predator back, which is the otter here, that trophic cascade is back in play. Otters eat the crabs, slugs survive, eelgrass thrives. The otter population is false. And there's really nowhere for them to go right now along the coast. They only have a two-dimensional way to go. And they've only gotten so far, and they're kind of buried at the end. But by learning how well they use an estuarine environment, and there are other estuaries, Morro Bay, up to San Francisco Bay and all, where historically there were more otters just in San Francisco Bay than there are in the whole range now. So if we learn what we learn here can be applied to other estuaries, we may find the key to helping the otters break out of their threatened species status. Otters originally were all up and down the coast, but what happened is the fur trading began. The Russians came over and they began killing a lot of them, selling their furs. The Chinese began doing it, we began doing it. And with all these different organizations hunting them, they hunted them almost to extinction. In fact, it was thought that the southern sea otter, which is now recognized as a different species, was totally extinct. Fortunately, there was a small group that lived down off Big Sur, and when they did discover they were there, they kept it really quiet. By then, protections had been created to protect the otters. So from that small group of 50 to 100 otters, they've been expanding up and down the coast. Along the way, in about the 1990s, some of them, they were used to an ocean environment, so they weren't used to a place like this. This was spring. But they began coming here, first the males checking it out, and then they left, and then the females came in. Females have the tufts here. Females taught the tufts how to use an estuarine environment. And now it's grown to where we have well over 100 otters living right here. Okay, guys, I have a couple different videos to show you guys. So I hope you guys enjoy. One of them is about a restoration. The other one is about oysteries. So hopefully you guys enjoy. And remember, if you have any questions, I will see you after spring break on um, Tuesday for our live stream session at 10 a.m. during our lab. Um, okay, guys, take care. Stay safe. Wash your hands.